Welcome to our video, Just This Once, sponsored by Avemco Insurance. Have you ever realized, just before doing something, that what you are about to do is contrary to a standard procedure, a regulation, an ethical belief, or something a mentor told you not to do? Everyone can most likely answer in the affirmative to that if they are being completely honest. It will be fine, just this once may have fleetingly passed through your conscious mind. How many times do mishaps occur after a person thought or even said out loud, I thought it would be okay just this once? The person recognized that they were deviating from a standard practice, a procedure, or something they had been told by a more experienced person. Think back a moment and try to recall if you have ever been in that situation. Do you know of anyone who has violated an established procedure and had a bad outcome? How about a person who has violated an established procedure and did not have a bad outcome? We will talk more about that later. To get us started, let's set the stage by talking about hazard and risk. Hazard is the source of danger, while risk is about how we manage that danger. For example, a rattlesnake is a hazard. It has a poisonous and painful bite. Encountering a rattlesnake behind glass in a zoo poses very little risk, while encountering a rattlesnake when walking in sandals outdoors poses a much greater risk. Flying an aircraft presents numerous hazards. Our job as pilots is to manage those associated risks to an acceptable level. Since our first flying lesson, we have been taught standard practices as an effective means of managing risk. We probably had a flight instructor or other mentor reinforce these or offer other helpful tips on being a safe pilot. Some of these things we have been taught are visually check fuel quantity, check controls free and correct, calculate weight and balance, remain clear of wake turbulence, don't fly with a known maintenance discrepancy, verify that the runway is long enough, and of course, there is much more. We have also been taught and examined on the FAA's regulations and established procedures on our flying. We may have had mentors such as flight instructors or other professional pilots reinforce the importance of following procedures and regulations. Where did these procedures and regulations come from? Though they sometimes may seem trivial and cumbersome, the hard truth is that they have been written in blood. How many of us have rationalized, I know I should or should not do something, but it will be okay just this once? It's probably unanimous. Why do we sometimes act contrary to what we know is right? Well, there are two main reasons, and they are related. We have all been warned about our first reason, which is external factors. Let's spotlight external factors for just a bit. Sometimes there is a time crunch. There might be weather moving in. Sometimes it's about comfort. Too hot, too cold, too rainy. Maybe we have a disability, either temporary or permanent. I know of a case in which the pilot died in a survivable crash because his head struck the panel. He had not fastened his harness because he had a shoulder injury and was unable to reach it. I think you can see from this photo that the cabin area is largely intact. From the NTSB accident report, quote, the shoulder harness was available for use but was not being used at the time of the accident. And also from the NTSB report, quote, According to friends of the pilot, he suffered from a shoulder injury which made it painful to use the shoulder harness, end quote. The autopsy report concluded that the pilot, quote, died as a result of blunt forced injuries to the head and neck, end quote. Uh, maybe we're in need of a restroom. I know I did something dangerous because I really, really needed a restroom once. I know of an accident in which a crew did not go do a go-around even when they knew they were landing too far down a short runway in a business jet and went off the end. I suspect it was due to an urgent need. Here's my story. One fall around Thanksgiving, I was flying my beach duchess from Nashua, New Hampshire to St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. It was a nice, cool, crisp day. I had consumed a little more coffee than I should have prior to the flight. About 30 minutes shy of the destination, I realized that a restroom would be nice. About 20 minutes shy of the destination, I realized that a restroom would be wonderful. As I entered the traffic pattern for only 2.8, I realized that a restroom was of the utmost importance. 
Now, before I continue, some of you may know that hunting is a premier activity in northwestern Pennsylvania. Note all the heavily wooded terrain to the east and south of the airport. Remember that this was around Thanksgiving when deer hunting is at its peak. When established on downwind, I did my best to check the runway and the surrounding area for deer. I put the gear down and added some flaps, made my radio call, and turned base leg. I turned on to final, did my gumps check, then I noticed something on the runway. At first, I assumed it was a deer and mentally prepared for a go-around. I was not happy given my bladder situation, but it was what it was. When I got closer in, I could see that it was two hunters walking down the middle of the runway with their backs to me. They had no idea I was there. The X shows about where the hunters were standing. I should have executed a go-around just like I would have done had they been deer. My bladder was drowning my good sense. I had the prop levers uh, all the way forward. I moved the throttles forward to their stops and I retracted the gear, maintained level uh, altitude at about 20 feet above the runway while I rapidly accelerated. I can imagine that it made them uh, need a restroom themselves as I went over the top of them. I entered the pattern and landed without incident. Uh, they were nowhere to be seen, but I, um, what I did was ri uh, very risky in more ways than one. I put myself and the hunters at unnecessary risk. I could have misjudged my altitude, had an engine failure, or caught a downdraft causing me to collide with them. They had loaded guns. They probably could have struck the airplane with gunfire as I climbed out. They could have been waiting for me and shot me when I got out of the airplane. My actions are not typical of me, and I knew better, but I thought that it would be okay just this once. Moving on, do we abbreviate a pre-flight inspection because we're afraid that we might find something wrong, we might be delayed, or there might be a cost consideration? The pilot might fear the cost of maintenance or might try to limit the Hobbs time or fuel burned. The pilot might not taxi to use the full length of the runway, might not execute a go-around, or might taxi too fast. This would again, of course, be a Hobbs consideration. Our second reason helps to explain why external factors can play a role in our decision making. It is our humanness. So let's put our humanness in the spotlight. Our humanness is very complex. We are not like computers. A computer runs a program that tells it exactly what to do. Each time the program is run, the result is the same. But the human brain is far more complex than any computer in existence. People are now developing artificial intelligence for computers, and what we see so far is quite impressive. But it is still far from operating at the same level as the human brain. The human brain uses natural intelligence to create its own programs that we call heuristics. They are mental shortcuts used to solve a particular problem. They are quick, informal, and intuitive algorithms our brain uses to generate an approximate answer to a reasoning question. For example, when we learned to fly, we had to remember to use both ailerons and rudder when beginning a turn, and we had to learn to add a little back pressure on the yoke. But now, we do it without consciously thinking about it. That is a heuristic at work. On a somewhat different level, but still heuristics, is our intent to comply with established procedures and regulations. But our humanness can sometimes override a program that our heuristics have created. When this happens, we have perhaps employed a cognitive bias. I like to group three of these cognitive biases together and call it the bias bundle bomb. Here's how that works. One of those cognitive biases is called illusory superiority. In this one, we all overestimate our own qualities and abilities relative to others. It is a human trait, and we all do it. The next is optimism bias. We all believe that we are less at risk of experiencing a negative event compared to others. We all do this also. We probably all know a smoker, even when bombarded by overwhelming evidence of the dangers, believes that they will not suffer from heart or lung disease. And the final member of the bias bundle bomb is confirmation bias, or sometimes called confirmation blindness. We are inclined to stick with a decision even when it is a bad one. Our brain filters out the evidence that we made a bad decision 
and only allows information that affirms our decision to get through. Let's not be like this guy. And when we combine these, the bomb might just explode. An example would be if we take off into forecast icing conditions because we believe we can handle whatever comes along. We encounter an icing condition but are optimistic and believe it will be okay just this once. Then we convince ourselves that it is actually getting better. Here's a fictional scenario that is based on a real event that I witnessed. The pilot was doing a pre-flight inspection on a single-engine Cessna and noticed that the left flap seemed to chatter a bit during flap extension. He repeated the flap retraction and extension with the same result. This did not seem normal to him, so the pilot decided to have a technician take a look at it. But no technician would be available for a couple of hours. So now what? The pilot decides to take a delay until the technician can take a look at it. But the purpose of the flight was to attending wedding 500 miles away. There was not time to drive, so the pilot decided to cancel. Here is a complication that we would call an external factor. The pilot's daughter is the passenger and is the maid of honor at the wedding. Uh-oh. The pilot checks the weather and finds that a front is moving in on the destination. He decides that if they leave now, they can make it in before the weather gets worse. We can beat the front if we depart within the next half hour. Let's go. The pilot decides to go and just not use the flaps. They arrive at their destination and learn two things. First, that only the short runway is available due to an incident on the long runway. And second, the light rain has begun, so the runway is wet. The pilot knows that a no-flap landing on this wet runway could be a problem, so he decides that the flaps will be okay to use just this once. The pilot begins to add flaps on downwind and the left flap catches and the mechanism fails at the flap motor. The left flap retracts fully, leaving the flaps immobilized with the right flap extended at about 25 degrees and the left flap fully retracted. The pilot can control it with aileron until the airplane slows down. It was not okay just this once. The pilot fell victim to one of our 12 common error causal factors, lack of awareness. Prior to arrival, he was not aware of the closed runway. Perhaps he could have diverted to a nearby airport. The pilot also fell victim to another one of our 12 common error causal factors, lack of knowledge. The pilot did not know that failure of a flap to operate smoothly is a sign that there is a problem with a flap track. The pilot also did not know that a stuck flap can cause a failure within the flap operating mechanism that will allow one flap to break free and stream with the airflow. We don't know what we don't know. We may not know why a procedure or regulation was put into place. Do we just assume that since we don't understand why it exists, it is not important? Every regulation and every procedure was put in place for a reason. We cannot know the reason or origin of all the regs and procedures. It is fine to question a procedure and learn more about it and to take uh, action to change it if that's appropriate. But just deciding to skip it just this once is a very, very dangerous thing to do. Once we begin to take chances and press our luck, we are in danger of going down that slippery slope in which we begin to deviate more and more from our good operating practices. Let's do an introspective poll. I am going to show you a series of questions that must be answered with yes or no. I want you to be totally honest with yourself, but only with yourself. Do not respond verbally and do not raise your hand. We are relying on introspection here. It is hard to be completely honest with ourselves, but let's give it our best shot. Have you ever made a takeoff or landing knowing that the crosswind component exceeded the manufacturer's maximum demonstrated crosswind component? Have you ever made a takeoff after a rough engine during a magneto check could not be cleared? Maybe saying, that's why we have two mags? Have you ever flown in violation of uh, Part 61 recent experience requirements? 
It might be passenger carrying, day or night, IFR, flight review. Have you ever flown in violation of Part 91 limits on alcohol use? Have you ever flown after taking an over-the-counter medication that lists a caution regarding driving or operating machinery? Have you ever flown without meeting requirements for medical certification, maybe FAA medical certificate or basic med? Have you ever intentionally withheld information from an aviation medical examiner regarding a condition or medication you are taking? Have you ever scud run? Have you ever entered clouds without having an IFR clearance? Have you ever flown with out-of-date charts, either VFR or IFR? Have you ever flown without visually checking the fuel level? We might begin with skipping or violating procedures or regulations just this once. We might progress to skipping or violating the procedure or regulation whenever something is not convenient. Then we move on to seldom doing or often violating a procedure or regulation. And finally, we simply never do or always violate the procedure. Every time we skip or violate something and it has a positive outcome, we are reinforced for our action and are much more likely to repeat it in the future. We should reflect on our previous actions and correct our attitudes for future activities. So in closing, let's look at some takeaways from this video. Be aware of the influence external factors can have on our aeronautical decision making. Recognize how our humanness in the form of cognitive biases can steer us into bad decisions. Never use just this once as an excuse for violating a procedure or rule. In case you did not know, Avemco offers a safety rewards program. Viewers of this video or those who take any safety education courses can receive a percentage off of their annual Avemco premium at the time of quote or renewal. Just let Avemco know. And please always remember, fly like your life depends on it.